Life Audio. That you are so valuable to God, that you are so worth it to Him, that there is so much glory, the heaviness, the weightiness of your soul, that God was willing to sacrifice His Son so that He might be in relationship with you. And all we have to do is believe. That is the simple and hard truth of the good news of Jesus Christ. Hey everyone, welcome back to How to Study the Bible. I'm Nicole Yudis, your host, your pastor, your friend, and I'm really excited for us to be together today with all of you from all around the world. I am so grateful for the opportunity to spend these few minutes together. I got a few little fun stats for you from last month. We had 122 countries represented last month, more than 30,000 of you, different people that have come to this podcast and more than 1.4 million downloads in the last year here at How to Study the Bible. So if you're new here, if you found us, if someone sent you this episode, welcome. We are glad you're here. I share with the, those numbers with you guys because I want you to maybe appreciate with me how we are all seeking together and how whatever your culture, whatever your background Wherever you find yourself today, there are people everywhere who are deeply desiring to connect with God, to experience God, who want to live a holy life, who want to understand what it really means to follow Jesus right here, right now, in this year, in your community, in your family, and you're not alone. And so if you've wondered if you're the only one wrestling or if you're the only one who feels like they care, you're not. You're absolutely not. And my prayer is tonight is that you might recognize that there are just feel in your spirit that there are believers all around you who are here to encourage you and to lift you up and to help you seek God as we seek God together. So it's very exciting. It's been super fun. Also this fall, I've been back out on the road. So at the time of this airing, I will have just gotten back from Victory Life Church in Colorado, where I was able to go and share a message with for the women's conference, as well as preach on Sunday. And then this coming weekend, I'm headed to New Hampshire to Berea Ministries. I'm going to be doing a women's retreat up there. So if you want to know where I'm going to be, maybe I'm coming to your town, go to my website or Instagram. You can check out what's coming up this month. Lots of places to be. Cannot wait to hug you, take a picture with you, share the word with you. There is no replacement for being together and in person, no replacement for worshiping together with so many believers around the world. It's just amazing. So I'm so grateful that I get to do that and grateful for this, our place of connecting each and every week. So we are going to continue in our series on the book of John, and I'm calling this first portion of the book the section where we talk about what it means to be rooted. What does it mean to be rooted in Christ? We're going to move from rooted into abundant. How do we experience abundant life? And then we're going to talk about freedom. How does Christ set us free? And what does that look like in our everyday lives? So rooted, abundant, and free. And we are on rooted part two today. We are going to talk about both chapters, John 2 and John 3, which is a hell bunch of content, just a lot of content. We're not going to be able to follow, just dive deep into all of it today, but we will kind of brush over a few things. And I've mentioned this to you guys before. Of course, there's times where we want to go really deep and we're going to look at one word today. And that's really powerful to look at a word and understand a word. But we also want to go high level. And sometimes the very best way to kind of understand how a book is developing and what God has for you in that book is to know like, okay, where is this generally going? What are the general themes? And we're going to talk about three stories within John chapter two and three that might not seem related at first. Like when you read them, you might think, I don't even know why these are coming after each other, but we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive. And I think we're going to be able to find just by looking at what the Bible says, how these things are connected. So we're going to be in John chapter two. If you want to open your Bible and want to join me in praying as we look to God's word together. Lord, thanks for the opportunity to study your word together. Would you open the eyes of our heart to receive from you right now, Lord, the the word of comfort, the word of encouragement, the word of challenge that you might have for each one of us. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us and would you allow us to be obedient 
to what you're teaching us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're in John chapter 2, and we're going to see that we are going, we are about to experience Jesus' very first miracle. And I'm going to paraphrase this section, and I'm going to want to hone in on one portion of the story. So in this story, Jesus is changing water into wine. So this story takes place at a wedding that Jesus was invited to. Most likely it was a family member, and they are at the wedding. And a wedding, a Jewish wedding, just a little backstory, is like a big deal, and it would last a long time. This is not just a several-hour event. This is a several-day event. And hospitality is incredibly important in that culture. So the ability to truly take care of your guests and create an amazing experience was super important in that culture as a way to honor the marriage, as a way to honor God, as a way to honor the community. So we enter this scene and Jesus pulls up on this wedding and his mother is like, they ran out of wine. Now, this would be a very big deal because it would be a a way to celebrate and a, a spirit of hospitality to offer wine. And so the fact that they had no wine left was a big deal. And Jesus kind of gives his mom a little bit of a rebuke. He's like, why are you involving me in this? But he immediately responds anyway. He's like, it's not my hour to do this. But then he turns to the servants and with just a word, and that's like a little bit of a context for you, is that Jesus doesn't do anything but speak. He speaks a word. And the word that he speaks is he tells the servants to fill these ceremonial washing, huge jugs of water that would be used to pure for purification rituals related to being in the Jewish faith. And he says, take those big, big vessels and fill them with water. It says they were 20 to 30 gallons each. And then he says, now draw some water out and bring it to the master of the banquet. And when they do, the water has turned into wine and not just any wine. But later in the story, the master of ceremonies is like, you saved the best wine for last. This wine is the best of all the wine. And Jesus made so much wine. Like it was like, an abundance of wine. And we'll see that theme in the book of John where Jesus does a miracle and it's an abundant miracle, like way more than was needed. And maybe like the first thing that I would point out to you guys as we think about this story being here is that the very first miracle that Jesus does is not utilitarian. It's not healing somebody who is paralyzed. It's not raising somebody from the dead. It's not letting someone see who is blind. It's making a party good. It's not a necessary miracle. And I think a lot of times we think about God like he's this like only God's only there for your dire circumstances. God's only there for when things are really, really bad. But Jesus's first miracle is when things were really good. And he he's there making something better in a, in a moment of hospitality. Completely unnecessary. We would all agree that is a completely unnecessary miracle. And yet... This is the way that Jesus, as we see, and this is the first important thing I want us to notice, is in 2.11. So this is chapter 2, verse 11. It says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Interesting. Not the servants at the wedding who filled up the jars with water and then saw it turn into wine. We don't know what happened to them not the master of ceremonies, not the people involved. It says that his disciples, the people who were near Jesus, were the ones who actually entrusted their lives to him. And it says that this was the first of the signs, okay? So we're going to see in the book of John seven signs, which seven is like the, the number, the divine number, the complete number. God created the world in seven days. Seven shows up in scripture over and over again as this number of completion, And in in the book of John, we're going to see seven signs that reveal Jesus's glory. Now, let's talk about glory for a minute, because that's not a word we really use, you know, frequently. Or if we do use it, like how, how, what does it really mean? So the Hebrew word for glory sort of means weighty or heavy. And I, I think that I love that idea that it's this visceral experience, that glory has weight to it. I'm sure that you've been in a moment where you've looked at nature and you felt the majesty, the weight of the moment, the weight of the experience. Perhaps you've looked out over the ocean. I just recently was in San Francisco with a friend and we happened to be able to see whales from the shore. There were whales just three swells out from where we were standing and they were breaching. They were showing their little fin, you know, so close to the shore and you just you feel the glory of the whale. It's just so big and so majestic and so outside of our own experience. You know, you're just kind of caught up 
in the glory of the whale. And this word glory, just it, it gives you that sense of I am in something that matters or in something that's meaningful. Another example of that this morning at our church, Hill City Church, we had baptisms and we were listening as people, adult baptisms who shared how their life had been transformed by Jesus. And in the midst of all the busyness of life and all the to-do lists and all the things that you're anxious about and all the things that worry you, when you are reminded that Jesus transforms lives, people didn't know, were far from God, did not know God, and now they know God because of the testimony of believers and that those believers, they have experienced their own signs of Jesus. They have experienced the glory of Jesus, the weight, the heaviness of Jesus, and that in doing so, their lives have been transformed. Now, just because glory is heavy doesn't mean that glory is not joyful, doesn't mean that it's always serious, because here we have Jesus, like proof text, the first thing Jesus does is make wine. So obviously, it's not that glory has to be this like, always serious, and always like, always purposeful and always utilitarian, because God designed his first miracle in the book of John is a miracle of hospitality. It's of radical generosity. It's it's unnecessary. It's not utilitarian. I know I keep using that word, but so often in our faith, I think we we lose the imagination, the beauty, the creativity, the hospitality, the joy of what it means to walk with Jesus. And this is an opportunity. If you have been missing your joy, if you have been missing the opportunity to actually realize that your life has been transformed by Christ, that you are forgiven and that you are free and that whatever you face, you face with Jesus and that you can live a life of joy. This is then this is your sign for today. This is a sign that take note of this passage and the story and just this abundant hospitality that represents who Jesus is. So we're going to move to the next vignette. We have three total. And the first one tells us about the hospitality of Jesus, right? And this is the sign. This is the first sign of Jesus's glory. And we're going to keep hearing this refrain about signs because the story is about to really turn all of a sudden. And we go down to the next part in chapter two. And the very next story that's written here is about Jesus clearing the temple courts. Things are really changing. We've just been partying at a wedding. And now Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And when he is in Jerusalem, he goes into the temple courts. And what he sees there frustrates him. He sees that people are selling cattle, sheep, and doves and exchanging money. And it says that he made a whip out of cords and drove everyone out of the temple courts, the sheep, the cattle, the coins, the money changers. And he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. So what's the backstory here? What's going on? How do we have Jesus radical hospitality? Now we have Jesus passionate, righteous anger. Well, what was happening here in the temple courts is that people were being taken advantage of. So the poor needed to come to Passover to offer a sacrifice. This is all part of the the Jewish system of sacrifices and temple worship that we see in the Old Testament. And so devout Jews were coming to Jerusalem to come to Passover to make a sacrifice to be in good standing with God. And that sacrifice would be dependent on their own wealth. Like if they could offer a ram, if they could offer a lamb, or if they needed to offer like just small birds. And so that was sort of allotted for in the code. But people would come and they wouldn't have that animal with them. They would need to buy that animal for the sacrifice. And these money changers in the temple were extorting people. They were taking advantage of people. They were driving up prices. They were literally just like running corrupt business in the sacred space of God's house. And this made Jesus angry. And he drove them out with passion and with zeal. And I, a lot of people know this passage because we're like, anger is not a sin. It's it's only what you do in your anger, which is true. Anger is an emotion. And we see here, obviously, if you read between the lines, like he made a whip and he drove out all the people that were in there. So it's not exactly happy times. But what we do see is Jesus's passion his passion for people, his passion for the right thing, and that he will go to great lengths to make sure that people are not taken advantage of. We serve a God of justice, and you see this heart of justice. And so over this time, and we're sort of seeing a picture of Jesus develop 
as we look at these different vignettes. Interestingly, when Jesus says and drives them all out of the temple, an interesting thing happens here. And what happens in chapter 2, verse 18, is this word. After he says, do not turn my, this, my father's house into a market, the Jews responded, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? So here we get, we hear a sign. So we hear in the beginning, this the water into wine, that was a sign of Jesus's glory. Now we're in the next vignette and we hear Jews who are demanding a sign from Jesus. Show us who you are. Show us what you can do. And Jesus says, this temple will be destroyed and I'll rebuild it in three days. And he's talking about his body. It says that in the passage. He's like, you are basing your worship in this place. You think that you're right. You think that you can follow the rules and that makes you right and righteous. But I'm here to tell you that it will be in me. You will find your dwelling in me. You will find your belief and your trust in me. And this is the beginning of Jesus's argumentative, contentious relationship with religious leaders and with people who do not believe in him. And if you have conflict in your life, take heart. There is a lot of conflict in the Gospels. There's a lot going on here. And Jesus was sinless. He was without sin. He was the perfect man. He was fully human and fully divine. He was the Son of God, and he was God in the flesh. So he did nothing wrong, and yet conflict and trouble came to him because he spoke the truth, and he lived in the light. And as he would speak these things, they, people who were convicted, who were ashamed, who were embarrassed, whatever they were feeling that made them respond in, in real hatred and animosity toward Jesus, this is what's happening. And it's very easy, you guys, to believe that if we are righteous, if we're following Jesus, if we're loving people well, we won't have conflict. And there couldn't be anything further from the truth. It says in Scripture, we see at the end of our passage, that those who live in the light love the light. And those who live in the dark, they hate the light. So there's an internal conflict going on here on earth with people who are living in deeds of darkness or people who are living in the light. And what we see with Jesus interacting with these folks, religious or not, more often religious, is that he confronts them to bring their real heart, their real behavior into the light. And he is so frustrated with these quote unquote religious people who are taking advantage of other people. They are, they're calling themselves holy and righteous, but they're doing something evil. And Jesus will always call that out. He always calls out deeds in the darkness that the motivation, the intent is wrong. And this is very convicting for us as believers to realize like Jesus looks at our heart. We need him. We need the mercy of Christ because our intentions, our motivations are mixed. We can often find ourselves tempted into deeds of darkness, into following our ego or following idols of this world. And Jesus is here saying, come into the light, come into the light, come be with me. Okay, last one for today, going into chapter three. And I certainly hope you will go back and revisit and read these slowly and do your deeper dive Follow your cross-references, read your study notes, see what God has for you here. I've given you plenty of things to read for this week, for sure. So chapter three, this is kind of our last part, is this beginning of chapter three, because I think these really go together beautifully. We have Jesus and his radical hospitality. We have Jesus and his righteous passion. And now we have Jesus, the person, having a conversation. And in this conversation, we see, again, this same theme, chapter three, verse two, it says there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who is a member of the Jewish ruling council. So let me just say, he's a very important person, very important religious person. And it says he came to Jesus at night, which probably meant he did not want to be seen. He did not want anyone knowing that he was having this conversation with Jesus. It would be unusual to come at night to have a religious conversation. You would have that in the temple like any normal person. But no, he comes at night and says, hey, he says, Rabbi. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with them. Everyone's noticing signs. Everyone's looking for signs. Aren't you still looking for a sign today? Aren't we exactly the same as these people in this story? Aren't we all looking for a sign? We're like, Lord, just show me your glory and I'll obey. Or God, just show me a sign that you're with me. Just show me a sign that you that you have me, that you that you believe it in me and I can believe in you and I just need to see a sign. And these people are like, show me a sign, show me a sign. Meanwhile, signs are happening, right? Things are happening, but people don't perceive it. They don't see it for what it is. And Nicodemus, though, says like, I know that something's going on with you. 
And Jesus now is the person who has a conversation. Jesus in his glory of radical hospitality and passion, passionate righteousness, right? And yet also Jesus who has conversations one-on-one and that shows his glory in the way that he relates to people. And he says to Nicodemus, no one will see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. This is very confusing to Nicodemus. People are often confused by Jesus's opening statements of conversation. He catches them off guard. And he's like, how can this be? No one can be born again. You can't go back into your mother's womb. And Jesus is like, aren't you a religious leader? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do you understand what I am talking about? Because I am talking about a spiritual birth, a spiritual rebirth that is possible for you. And he goes into this conversation. Nicodemus is still confused by this, but it says we we hear some of the most beautiful words from Jesus as he begins to prophesy about what is going to happen to him. And he says in verse 8 to 14, just as Moses lifted up a snake in the wilderness, the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, I don't know if you know the story, crazy story about Moses and the snake in the wilderness. But just a quick point on that. I want to make sure that I point you to it so that you can go read it yourself. It's in Numbers chapter 21. If you want to go read the story in Numbers 21, here's what I want you to know is happening. There's the very broad strips. The Israelites are wandering in the desert. They're following Moses. We could talk about that another time. But basically, they're following God and Moses is their leader. And they keep being disobedient again and again and again. And they have a plague hit the camp and people are dying from this plague. And God says to Moses, put a snake on a staff and hold it up and tell the people, if you will look at the snake, you will be healed. That's all they had to do. They said, look at the snake to be healed. So think about what what that requires. What does it require to do something that sounds crazy, to do something that you, you have to believe, you have to have some faith to believe this might work. And some people in that camp, many, many people still died in that camp who refused to look at the snake. Now, that might sound crazy to us. We're like, why wouldn't you do that? But I want you to think about human nature. Think about how stubborn we are, how hard hearted we are, how hard it is for us to change our mind when we think we are right about something. And all they had to do was look at the snake. And yet people chose not to do it. Now, Jesus is making a connection to that story. And Nicodemus would have known that story very well. And Jesus said, I'm going to be lifted up and people are going to have to look look to me and anyone who believes will have eternal life. Now, what do we know that Jesus was lifted up on? Jesus was lifted up on a cross. And on that Christ, he paid the on that cross, he paid the ultimate price. He made the ultimate sacrifice for us. And all we do is look to him. We have to look and believe into him. And that's the way that we have eternal life. And this is this little story, this little thing you maybe have never heard before is right before the verse that almost everyone has heard. And it's John three sixteen. So right after Jesus tells the story, just as Moses lifted up the snake, the son of man is going to be lifted up. He says these beautiful words for God so loved the world. That's you and me that he gave his one and only son, that's Jesus that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, that's me and you, but to save the world, that's me and you, through him. For God so loved me and you that he sent his son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to me and you, to condemn me and you, but to save me and you. That's the truth of the story of who Jesus is. That is the sign of who Jesus is. Over and over again, we're going to see people asking for a sign. And Jesus says, the sign that you're going to get is that I'm going to be lifted up. I am going to be sacrificed for you and on your behalf. That's what you have to believe in. Guys, it's, it's the simple fact of the gospel. It is the best news you've ever heard. And in some ways, it's the hardest news to believe that you are so valuable to God, that you are so worth it to him, that there is so much glory, the heaviness, the weightiness of your soul, that God was willing to sacrifice his son so that he might be in relationship with you. And all we have to do is believe. That is the simple and hard truth 
of the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we're here to talk about. That's what we're here to do. So as you guys think about what does this mean for me this week, I thought I'd write you a couple of questions that you might journal about as you think about these different stories that we've heard. Talk to God about how it feels to know his very first sign of his glory was at a party and sparked joy. Talk to God about how you feel about this idea that the very first sign of Jesus's glory was at a party and it sparked joy. Do you experience joy and hospitality in your life? How might you invite someone into joy and hospitality in your life this week? Second question, are you looking for a sign? What are you looking for and how would you know if you got it. Maybe another way to say that or another way to praise God for what he's done is I would ask you to look back at your life and perhaps there have been signs along the way that you did not perceive as signs the first time. But in looking back, you see God's glory in your life. Let's thank God and praise God for those things. Let's capture them in writing because when you do, you attest to the miracle that is your soul. You attest to the miracle that is the transforming power of God in your life. And that is what God has given us to celebrate. Much love to you guys this week. I can't wait to talk again next week. I'll see you soon. How to Study the Bible with Nicole Eunice is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you like what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review the podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com.